that's been the masculine role anyway, which is to form the 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 palisade, the barrier, the the perimeter on the outside of the family, and to handle the stress outside, so that the women can handle the domestic sphere on the inside, and that's where they reign supreme and where they maintain control. Naturally, when a when a man tries to step forward and take any kind of leadership in his family, of course, social media is going to erupt and call him a horrible tyrant and say that I'm suppressing my wife. Fatherlessness in America is at massive epidemic levels. 99% of mass shooters, more than 99% of mass shooters, come from fatherless families or or did not have a father in their primary home. Well, good. Good afternoon, Mayor Adam Lane Smith. It's an absolute honor to have you on the Ridiculously Human podcast, buddy. Uh, thank you for joining me. It is wonderful to talk to you finally face to face like this. Thank you. <laughs> cool. So I first listened to you on uh, Chris Williamson's podcast, Modern Wisdom, and I think which episode I've... was it? I've been on there. I've been on there four times. So I'm curious. Where'd you come in? Okay, the one that I've 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 listened to a few of yours, but the, the one I listened to, I think first was the 17 Ugly Truths. <laughs> that no one wants to admit and uh that was a great one because i've like i've probably listened to it like three or four times now because there's so much in there you know and and i've also listened to it with my wife in the car i was like we have to listen to this it's a, it's a good one to listen to together as a couple you know there's there was a few awkward moments in there because like you said it's some hard-hitting truths but um yeah, very, very impactful, impactful stuff. So, so thanks a lot for that. Thank you. I know that you've just had your, your fifth child. I just wanted to kind of find out like, how is that going, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I just bought a farm up in Wisconsin where I live with my wife and our five children together. Uh, it's going fantastic. There are turkey and deer wandering through my yard, probably as we speak. Um, I have five wonderful children, two sons and three daughters. And my wife is about as as much of a frontiers woman as you could possibly imagine. She likes to hunt and skin and butcher her own animals and uh, make her she grows her own herbs and and vegetables in her own garden. And uh, when she's not doing that, she's doing bodybuilding, and she can outbench most American men, uh, which is pretty interesting. And that's uh, it's going great up here, man. Right now, I think my kids are running, screaming in the backyard with sticks, chasing invisible coyotes or something. That sounds awesome. You, you sound like you live a really sort of like almost self-sustainable in a way kind of lifestyle uh, there on your own farm. Um, and also talking about like your wife, you know, bench pressing a lot. So you've also been on your own weight loss journey. And uh, how's that been going for you? Fantastic with the help of many friends. So Sal Stefano from Mind Pump especially has been really helpful with helping me with nutritional advice. Uh, I've been working with uh, Ali from the BOD team as well on, on some of those components. Getting the food right has been the biggest thing, really the biggest change in my life. I was already running around the farm, chasing my kids, swinging them around, carrying five kids. Pretty hard when you're, when you're walking and you have all five kids strapped to you already with their arms and legs wrapped around your limbs. Um, exercise is not a problem. It was the food component, especially here in America. Our food is, is pretty bad. So you got to take care of yourself and make sure you're doing the right thing. Food is medicine. Make sure that you're taking the right medicine in the right doses. There's actually a young girl who's just uh, produced a documentary. I think her name is Grace Price on, uh, I've seen it on Twitter and, uh, it talks about like how food is responsible for so many cancers that exist in today's society. And it's, uh, I mean, especially in America, it seems like yeah, there's there's something strange about your guys' sort of food system, and uh, yeah, it's it's quite concerning in in some some regards. We uh, yes, and we won't talk too deep about it, so neither one of us disappears in the night. So it'll be all right. <laughs> Classic. So, um, something interesting that you actually posted recently on social media was that you consume all the news in your household, and you actually tell your wife like, okay, if this there's something worth knowing. I was kind of wondering, how did the joyful world of social media <laughs> respond to you, you being that consumer of the news and telling your wife? So naturally, when a, when a man tries to step forward and take any kind of leadership in his family, of course, social media is going to erupt and call him a horrible tyrant and say that I'm suppressing my wife, which is why I started this conversation off mentioning that she hunts butchers and bench presses better than pretty much any man in America for the most part. I have a, one of her trophies over there, her hunting trophies we need to hang up because it's we had to move the spot for painting. So it, it, it's not that she is a put upon helpless damsel in distress that the feminists need to ride to her defense. It's that she does not want to consume that level of propaganda, that level of fear mongering. Uh, in the old days, they used to call what is today considered normal press and normal news. They used to call it yellow journalism. 
And that was sensationalism. It was designed to sell newspapers. It was designed to inspire terror and fear. It was heavily biased. And I remember speaking not that long ago. Um, I, I'll preserve my client's pr uh, pr privacy, but uh, a member of the intelligence community discussing the fact that there's in any given situation, there's a hundred facts, right? And what news media will do is take 10 of the most convenient facts that they think will drive the most clicks and the most outrage in their population, spread just those 10 facts. Now their communication with their people and their customers gives them 10% of the information and elevates their mood through the roof. While the other new studio across the street is doing the opposite with their group, then they clash their groups together, drives even bigger, higher clicks. This is the normal system for spreading news today. So I did not want my wife in that, and she did not want to be in that. So she wants me to read the news and filter everything and give it to her only on an as-needed basis so that she can live a happy local life with the people in our community, in the village we live in, and taking care of our five children without a massively escalated cortisol level. That's a responsibility and a sacrifice I'm happily willing to take on. And uh, like, how's it actually going? Like, do you find that it works well? Does she ever go, hey, listen, uh, I heard something here. Why didn't you tell me it? Man, no, that's never been the case. Never, never, never. Uh, anytime there is an issue, I sit her down and say, okay, hey, I need to tell you something. Let's sit down. Let's talk about this. Here's something that is happening. Here's how it could affect us. Here's how we're going to make sure it does not affect us. And we build a resiliency plan and we take care of each other that way. There's never been a case where she's ever said, man, I, I wish I had known more about that in advance so that I could have been miserable for six months. Because most of us, by the time an issue even gets to us, it, it's so tiny and minuscule that it doesn't matter. I, I lived through Y2K. I barely survived Y2K, right? Most of us barely survived it. We, we barely survived the, the Africanized killer bees coming over to America and wiping all of us out. We barely survived in the 80s. It was global cooling. We barely survived global cooling. And then we barely survived global warming. And we barely survived. Right. And, and by the time it gets to us, it's not like, you know, global warming is coming down the street with a gun ready to shoot you in the head. It's like, oh, man, that is slightly unfortunate. Slightly unfortunate is usually what the, we get when most news comes to us eventually. So there's never been a time she's needed to know more than she has. And there's been every time that she's been happy she didn't get massively spammed with that level of propaganda. I believe that is a husband's job in most cases to take on that level of fear and pain throughout all of human history. That's been the masculine role anyway, which is to form the, the, the palisade, the barrier, the, the perimeter on the outside of the family and to handle the stress outside so that the women can handle the domestic sphere on the inside. And that's where they reign supreme and where they maintain control. That's been throughout all of human history, how we have operated because our immune systems our, our neurology, our biology, everything is designed for us to operate effectively in those spheres. Does every couple have to? No. Am I going to come into your house and yell at you if you aren't doing it that way? No. But by and large, this is what our biology supports. Well, I mean, to, you know, in accordance with current like um, news and social ways of doing things, you're, you're already being controversial there. You know what I mean? It's like, it's so insane how confused society is about our roles and genders and all these sort of things and it's like yeah it's just weird how yeah how confused everyone seems to be and pushing these crazy kind of like ideological ways of um of thinking but uh but yeah that's also wasn't it funny how feminism disappeared for the first year of covid as all of a sudden it was it was terrifying and all of a sudden we had to rely on each other for survival all of a sudden all the women were very very afraid of what was going to happen and they needed someone to bring them toilet paper wasn't it amazing how feminism was quiet for about one year when they thought that they were there was an actual threat? It was amazing, <laughs> and but it's also amazing like how I guess feminism is is so quiet in terms of like this sort of transgender uh, sort of wave. I don't know the right term to to use, but that we're experiencing at the moment. They they don't seem to be too loud mouthed about that, which is in my opinion, quite concerning and totally against what they actually fought for. Everybody has pet projects that they're very passionate about. And a lot of people are on a journey to try to make themselves feel important and specific areas will resonate with them and will feel important and make them say, this would make me feel important enough if I support X, Y, or Z. And I'm, I'm saying this as a non-political statement, people on the left, people on the right, people up, people down, purple people, polka dot people everybody is out there trying to feel important. And that's what happens when we don't actually have a defining set of core principles. 
and a defining life purpose that we are pursuing, then we have to try to feel important. And that's really what I think most people are doing out there right now. So what do you think is like missing then that's causing them to do that? Well, do you want to dive into my specialty attachment? Because I happen to know that that's what is missing. Yeah, well, I mean, let's go for it because that stuff is fascinating. (laughs) For everybody listening at home, if you're not familiar with attachment theory, let's make this real simple. When you are born, you cannot take care of yourself and you have to learn, will other people care for me, help me, be reasonable, be arbitrary, be hurtful, abandon me? And if they do not act appropriately, is it their fault for being unreliable when they are stressed out and I can't trust people? Or is it my fault for having something wrong with me that makes people reject and abandon me? And if your parents raise you, hopefully like I'm raising my kids, God willing, to believe that I will listen with them, talk with them, build solutions collaboratively with them, they can get their needs met. My son comes to me and says, dad, I want a Godzilla action figure. I don't say, no, you don't get that, or you know, you owe me, or anything like that. I say, hmm, okay, well, let's talk about that. What are you wanting? Why are you wanting it? And let's talk about when is a good time you could get that, and let's talk about what would need to be done for you to earn that, and let's just build it together. Let's build that solution. I don't really tell my kids no. If they say, I want ice cream, I don't say never, and I also don't say, here's ice cream every single day for the next five years. I say, well, let's talk about the appropriateness of ice cream. Let's talk about how you can earn that and help you, how you can use it wisely right? There's a time and a place to eat chocolate ice cream. So if your parents do that with you, you develop secure attachment, which is great. Unfortunately, about 65% of Gen Z adults did not build secure attachment. 35% of them are securely attached. 65% of Gen Z adults, the research shows, have insecure attachment. Either they believe that there is never going to be love or care directed to them from other people because other people are incapable of it, and therefore they are in lone wolf survival mode, or they believe that other people will never love them because they themselves have something wrong with them that makes them unworthy of love. So they are in approval seeking and people pleasing mode perpetually. That's anxious attachment style or avoidant attachment style. And about two to 5% of them, the research shows probably have a blend of both what we call the disorganized style, where they are both fearful of self and fearful of other people. 65%. It's getting worse. Uh, The research shows about 50% of millennials have this and about 35% of boomers have this is what the research shows. So it's definitely escalating. This is a survival adaptation that kicks on naturally when human society is in collapse and when social collapse has happened and when stability is gone and resources are scarce and people have to sort of fight for survival, especially as children. This is an indicator that we are already in a social collapse because more than half of the population is now experiencing it. And we are existing in the rubble of a situation that uh, we don't realize has collapsed because our systems are still holding us upright. It's interesting that you say it's like society is kind of collapsing. It's a a signal. Um, That's kind of like an interesting thing. I I was wondering, like, is it also because like there's issues with sort of uh, families now and around fatherhood? I mean, I know in America there's something, there's some like crazy statistic where you have I don't know, like 17 million families that are fatherless, like, you know, because either it's like, you know, single mother, um, the father left, or, you know, just like a, I guess a one night stand and, you know, just have a single mom. And um, that, that's, that's quite concerning. That's a huge, a huge number, 17 million families. I would be surprised if it was actually that low. I'd be, I, I would actually be, be believing it was much higher than that. Fatherlessness in America is at massive epidemic levels. Uh, 99% of mass shooters, more than 99% of mass shooters come from fatherless families or or did not have a father in their primary home. Uh, fatherless issues are not just from deadbeat dads. It's, it's also from uh, courts taking away children from fathers, from false accusations from mothers. It's massive custody disputes and massive custody bias in, in terms of moms, even drug addict moms. Uh, and massive sympathy for for those mothers. It is also deadbeat fathers walking away, choosing not to be part of that life. It is single mothers getting knocked up after five or six or 10 dates on Tinder and not knowing who the dad is. There, there are so many challenges that are happening right now. And the family decay is a part of an escalating process that I've tracked out over the last 110 years here in America, where attachment issues are getting worse. And they have been since the 1910s, since World War I. It's been getting worse and worse and worse with each successive generation to the point that most modern generations have never seen a functioning society or hardly seen a functioning family at all. 
So they don't even have that framework, which is why we've arrived at the 65% insecurely attached rate. The collapse of the family is the problem, and it's also a growing symptom of the problem. So how do you like resolve attachment issues if you if you like a young adult, you know, like or even if you I guess an oldish adult, like in your forties and you you have these kind of attachment issues, how do you resolve them? How do you even find out that you have them? You know what I mean? Well, let me ask you this. Let me ask you a question if I can get a little personal here for a minute. Who do you have in your life? Who's one person in your life that you know loves you? My wife. Good. I like that. It's a good good answer. How do you know that she loves you? Uh, just because I mean we we're very close and we we talk a lot and we tell each other we love each other and we act like we love each other and I mean we have a beautiful daughter together that we you know that we yeah that we just lucky to have and we 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 do stuff together you know we go on adventures we're just literally planning for a seven month around the world venture at the moment so we we kind of you know we invest in each other I love that you said something important in there you said we talk to each other quite a lot which is excellent when you talk to each other do you share a little bit of surface level things do you hold things back from each other because you're afraid that they won't be able to receive you properly or accept you do you share pretty openly with your wife? Is there is there not much of a filter at all? I think I'm more honest uh, with my wife uh, than she is with me, and I, I I guess I can kind of understand why she isn't. And and hers is like growing up with without a father. You know, I mean, she, her father was an alcoholic, and um, her folks got divorced. As, I mean, my folks were also divorced, but um, but I still had a father and a stepfather. But I think I think there's a lot to do with that. You know, like not having just not having that presence there for her, for her oh that's massive that's massive so let's dissect that a little bit for the people at home listening to this because they yeah, need a please. practical example thank you thank you for being you um you share with her you share openly with her you share a concern you share a problem you share a fear and she receives it she smiles she accepts you and she loves you despite it how does that feel it feels great you know like knowing that you have someone in your corner you know that's uh that's why I say it, you know, because I like her to know. Absolutely. That's the release of a couple of key brain chemicals. One is oxytocin. When we have low stress, low cortisol, and then we feel loved and accepted by somebody and we share with them and receive that acceptance, we release oxytocin and very important bonding chemical that bonds you tightly to that other person. Incredibly important to have this for the human experience. Oxytocin releases something called GABA, G-A-B-A, gamma aminobutyric acid. GABA suppresses your anxieties and, and cortisol releases in the future. So after you talk to your wife, the next day, you probably are more resilient against stress, wouldn't you say? Yeah. GABA also helps release melatonin at night. So probably after you have a great conversation with your, not with your wife, you probably sleep like a log that night, right? I generally sleep like a log, but yeah, I guess probably, <laughs> probably better. <laughs> yeah. Now, Ga now, as you talk with her and experience that oxytocin, you also, through that conversation, usually saturate yourself with serotonin. Serotonin is the neurotransmitter that really relays contentment, satisfaction, happiness even is what we could call it. It's a long-term satisfied feeling. Dopamine is like a sugar high, like I, I ate a candy bar. Serotonin is like I ate a rich, warm holiday meal and it's going to sit in my stomach for a good 24 hours. That, that's what that feeling is. You probably feel very content after you talk with your wife, yeah? Always, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's nice to have an outlet. I love that. So you say that you know your wife loves you because when you share with her, she receives you, she accepts you without question and without hesitancy. She helps you to feel the release of oxytocin and GABA and sleep better at night. And she helps you release that serotonin experience in your brain so that you can feel content and you're more resilient against stress in the future. That is the experience of human love. Now, that is what we experience through something called secure attachment, by communicating with people, by having those experiences. Now, the more the experiences you have like that with your wife, the more loved you're going to feel. And in fact, the more you're likely to then say, well, she loves me, other people could too. And you'll be more open with friends, more open with family, more open on podcasts with weird guys who walk in from the internet talking about your feelings and attachment. You'll be more open because you have less to hide and your brain is so resilient. That is the power of secure attachment in life and in mental health. Now, most people who are listening to this podcast, you guys out there, maybe you're saying I could never be that open with somebody. I've never received that acceptance with somebody. I don't think anybody would receive me. I think they would use it against me. I think that if I opened up, they may reject me. They may abandon me. They, they may judge me. And rightly so, because I am a worm who doesn't deserve love. If they really knew me, they wouldn't accept me. 
There's nobody who cares about me that way. Now, if you continuously don't receive those experiences, you will be more and more depressed and miserable and unhappy. If you, in fact, hold off on that, you'll become desperate and you'll start chasing either the high of oxytocin, if you're anxiously attached, getting the mimic oxytocin from people who are more manipulative and will make you feel it so they can then manipulate you. Or if you're avoidantly attached, lone wolf syndrome, you won't really feel oxytocin because you don't even know that this is available. And Gareth's experience is completely foreign and alien to you. You've never opened up to somebody to that extent and you never will because you're sworn not to. And you chase dopamine instead, which is where a lot of addictive behaviors come in to cope with the stress levels that you're probably experiencing. So that, that's how you either spiral up like Gareth here, or you spiral down as you become less resistant to stress and pain. And you're more likely to experience stress and pain in the future because you don't have people helping you. And if Gareth, I bet it's not just your wife, you have family, you have friends, you probably have a number of people you've opened up with. That is secure attachment. That's why your life is good and satisfying. Not perfect, but good and satisfying. People who don't have that, that's why their life is lonely, stressful, and feels like it's never going to get better. What do you say to somebody like that that does want to say open up, but they don't they, they may be worried about what they their partner might say because they, I don't know, they might, that's probably why they're not speaking is they're just worried about what they'll say or they might be laughed at or, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you start that way with your wife at the beginning or, or did she start that way with you actually? It might, it kind of sounds like. No, not at all. I mean, I've always, I'm always think I've been a pretty open book, you know, both of us, both of us uh, have, um, but, but yeah, no, not, not at all. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, I'm just trying to like think of people that might be in that situation where they're like, oh, I really want to talk to my. How did she learn to trust you? Because it sounds like she's had some hesitancy there. How did she learn to trust you over the course of this time together? I guess seeing me in action, you know, like knowing that I'm a, a reliable guy. I'm not going to treat her badly. Uh, she can trust me. Like I'm not going to go and cheat on her. Like there's no, there's nothing like that. Um, and I think, yeah, it would, it would kind of be that, you know, like she would maybe see me around my friends and that I'm, you know, the same bloke. I'm not like trying to change or anything like that. I just Mm -hmm. just being quite authentic, I think, you know, mm -hmm. and then maybe around family, the same thing. Just, just, I'm, I'm just this kind of normal bloke. I'm not trying to pretend I'm anyone I'm not. And I think that just builds up trust slowly, you know? I love it. I can tell that you're securely attached because uh, that's level one of the four levels of trust. So when I have people come in, whether they're anxiously attached and don't like themselves or they're avoidantly attached and they don't know who to trust and, and don't ever want to trust anybody, I run them through the four levels of trust. And I say level one, Basic level trust is exactly what you just said. Do, are, they, are they consistent and self-policing with an explicit code of conduct or behavior or honor that you know what it is and you can track it and you see that they're consistent during times of stress when it costs them something, they still do it. They are the same person with their friends, with anybody else. And if they ever fall short, they make it right and they build a plan to fix it because they don't want to be a, a person who breaks their honor code. They want to keep it. So you don't have to police them. You don't have to be responsible for them. You don't have to track them. You don't have to manage them. You can relax and be calm and trust them. That's one reason your wife trusts you. Now I'm going to give you a second reason your wife trusts you, which is the second level of trust. You have a long-term goal that she sees you aiming for, that you keep aiming for again, that when you deviate from it, you aim right back to it. If you ever break from it, you pull back to it. She can always track that you are going to aim towards your goal so you're predictable to her and it's a goal that she respects. So she's happy to help you with it and she can respect you because you're a man who keeps trying to build that mission. Yeah. Two for two so far. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Beautiful. <laughs> Maybe a little blimp, like one little blimp like, along the way, but that happens, you know? Of course. That's that, Again, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. It's self-policing. Do you shift back to it? Beautiful. I'll give you the third reason that your wife trusts you. Okay. It is called mutual acceptance. So number one, she trusts you because you take ownership of your shortcomings and you try to improve them. You try to fix them and you keep growing through them. So you don't get defensive if she points out something that's not going right. You say, hey, cool, I need to fix that. You also are clear with her about how your challenges will affect her and you try to make sure it doesn't so that you can keep her from having the negative, negative impacts of your problems. So you're managing your problems and trying to protect her from them at the same time so that she can choose to accept you because she trusts you in that capacity. At the same time, you can tolerate and accept her shortcomings without enabling her. You could say she doesn't share with me as often as she'd like, but she gives it her best shot and she shares the important things with me. And I can trust her in that regard, right? 
You accept her shortcomings even as you encourage her to work on them, and she takes that ownership too. That's the third level of trust. Now, I will tell you the fourth reason that your wife trusts you. Level four of trust is called mutual fulfillment, is being able to go to your spouse or friend or, or whoever and say, I want to be the best spouse to you that I possibly can. Tell me the two or three things that really help you feel loved. I call it the what, why, and how often method. What do you need from me? What two, three, two, three things do you need from me? Why are those important so that I can understand you? And then how often do you need them so that you feel loved? Great, I can do those. In return, here are the two or three things I need that help me feel loved. Here's why, and here's how often. Can you take care of those for me? Excellent. Let's take care of each other and really fulfill each other. That's the fourth level of trust. When you do all four, you build a phenomenal, secure relationship with that person. Now, does that make sense why your wife trusts you now? Makes total sense. Absolutely. And I was just thinking, like, as you were saying that, I can imagine that like the fourth one that you're talking about, probably many people don't even ever get there, you know, and, and that's probably what causes a lot of issues. Like they don't actually talk about what their, their needs, wants and desires are and why. So it's worse than that. It's actually much worse than that. Most people skip completely over the four levels of trust entirely and they leap into the great feelings that are supposed to come from level four. So they have a level four feeling with a level zero trust. And then when the good feelings finally end, they say, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. This was a bad feeling. And then they freak out because they realize they don't have any level of trust whatsoever. And the other person is not predictable. They haven't taken ownership and nobody has accepted anything. It's just been a bunch of good feelings. Then they freak out and they try to suddenly have all the difficult conversations now that the feelings are not good. And now that the trust has been completely broken. That's why most couples break up. 98% of dating couples split up. And it's usually around the five to set five to 12 months, somewhere in that window is usually the death because dopamine, novelty dopamine wears off at five months. And that's where, that's where the ride ends. No, it's, and it makes sense. I even look back at say like some of my old relationships, I would always find around about like six months. I was like, okay, kind of like a little bit bored here sort of thing, you know, <laughs> and it, maybe it wasn't anything to do with the person. It was just like an immaturity in terms of our didn't really know how to be a, a solid partner, you know, and I wasn't, I always had no clue about the stuff you're talking about now, you know, now I think I'm a bit more aware of these sort of things, but I think so many people are actually very immature in relationships and especially like loving relationships because we're not taught the stuff that you're, you're telling us anyway. Like, I mean, just the thank you know, thank, um, thankful for the internet because you know, like now we can find guys like you, you know, that are, okay, cool. These are, these are, these attachment issues are maybe why you're experiencing uh, issues in your relationship or you got divorced or whatever. But, but I think it, it would be a good subject to almost have at school, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. I think, I think it's, uh, my goal is to teach 1 billion people on the face of this planet as long as I'm alive, 1 billion people about attachment. I think that those are heirloom skills that we can hand down through families these are family skills is what these really are so that your family raises you with secure attachment so that your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents, your cousins, everybody steps in and helps you foster secure attachment. Even if your parents for some reason don't, that's what family systems are designed to do. They're supposed to be massively redundant systems so that we can foster good secure attachment, no matter what happens between parents and kids. We've lost all of that now. So we need to rekindle family networks and we need to rekindle even pseudo family networks where we bond together in, in different ways and different groups, but we need to rebuild family. And that's where these skills need to be handed down. You said something interesting as well, which was the, I think the trust number two and where I guess the, the man has this mission um, and effectively the lady, she kind of creates this vision of you. You know, she's like, cool, this is my husband. This is my, the vision that I have of him. And she keeps that vision. And, and I don't think guys generally realize that your wife has this vision of, of who future you is, you know, because that's who she's married. She's married. She likes you, but she actually can see the potential in you, so to speak. And um, when they get married or whatever, then the guy kind of like, you know, he starts relaxing and um, getting maybe a little bit lazy, uh, but he's still providing, you know, he's like, oh, cool, I'm still work hard and I'm still uh, you know, provide financially, et cetera. But in other parts of the relationship, he kind of gets lazy, but he thinks he's doing his bit. And then all, and, but the lady, her vision, like, she's like, well, this is not the guy I expected, you know, he's, you know, and, and then all of a sudden, like, I don't know, after two years, five years, she's like, I'm done. 
And then guys are surprised and they're like, what are you talking about? I've been like working my ass off and I've been, you know, providing financially. And it's like, no, that's what exactly what you got wrong. Like uh, you, your wife's vision of you changed and you didn't even kind of realize it. Is that something like related to, to number two or that you, you know, you experienced that? Oh, so I, I worked for years as a licensed manager of family therapist. Now I, I work with individuals and couples and I coach them through in and, and all my, ex, in all my clinical experience. That story you just told, the thing that's missing there is all the conversations that that couple should have been having for that five years, all the conversations about, you know what, um, you are providing financially and that's amazing. And I value that and respect you for that. I also have these emotional needs and here's what they are. And here's how, here's measurable needs that I can give you that I really need you to fulfill so that I feel loved. And the man says, okay, I understand what you're asking me. I'm going to do it. Or he says, I don't understand. Well, let's find a third party who can help me understand right? Let's get this taken care of. All the conversations that should have been there. So many guys, unfortunately, they, especially avoidant men. I wrote a book behind my, my shoulder there, uh, Exhausted Wives, Bewildered Husbands, about couples who get divorced at 20 years for this exact cycle, is the woman gets in, she's usually anxious attached, doesn't know that she can ask questions, doesn't know that she can make demands and, and requests and ask and talk and, and share. And then she starts just sort of like telling him that she needs to feel things he has no idea how to help her feel things because he's never felt loved. He's never felt important. He's never felt like a priority to somebody. So he just throws dopamine at her and tries to make her happy with gifts, jewelry, flowers, whatever it is. That's not what she's seeking. Over time, she thinks that he doesn't care about her when in fact he's given everything for her and she truly feels unloved while he truly feels utterly frustrated and confused. And yes, at 10, 15, 20 years, they get divorced and it's something they could have avoided if they had had the right conversations. Most of them just don't have the skills, though, necessary to build those conversations. That's why they come to people like me is to get those skills and have those conversations just to finally put them to bed and then avoid that 20 year divorce. That's that's what they need. People need skills and they never learn them as kids. Yeah, you've said it twice now, like around communication. And for, for such a long time, I've always just said, like, I think the number one thing in the world is like communication in, in terms of not, not just relationships, but everything. I think bad communication and lack of communication kind of destroys everything. So really quick, the famous speaker, Vin Zhang, um, he's fantastic. I, I, I love learning from him. He's a speaking trainer. He's, he's incredible. Uh, he, he had a great point that he expressed. He said, communication is everything that happens outside of your head. It, it, it is your vocal patterns. It's the words you use. It's your body language. It's your clothing. It's your facial expressions. It's your, your beard, the way you style your beard. It, it's everything about you that you express what is inside your head to give other people an idea of what's happening inside your head. So if you aren't learning and growing in your communication ability, then what's inside your head is a prison. You are trapped there, incapable of actually expressing things to those around you, to your wife, for example, to your son, to your best friend, to your boss. The, everything indeed is communication, even, even to the extent my friend John Delaney has a famous saying, Behavior is a language. Your behavior itself is communication. And you speak to people through the actions you perform and the choices you make. Everything is communication. So when we say that everything in relationships comes down to communication, relationships are communication. You cannot have a relationship without communication. The better your communication is, the better your relationships become, point blank. And why do you think people are so scared to communicate like honestly in relationships? I think that people learn early on in childhood that communication is dangerous. And that they're either going to be hurt or brushed off or dismissed or emotionally hurt because parents don't have time for it. Parents are too tired for it. Parents don't want to listen. Parents are annoyed. Parents are exhausted. Parents are gone or whatever it may be. The kids learn that communication is bad. They, they don't just not learn to communicate. They learn it's bad. So then they have to fight their limbic system. They have to fight their emotional agitation. They have to fight their escalating right side brain and escalating cortisol association against communication. You talked about your wife having a difficult time kind of opening up fully during those conversations because she didn't have a father. That, that creates immense cortisol stress in a young woman because she doesn't have a, a primal protector in her life. So then she has to protect by containing, by withholding. If her mother was really stressed out, then she couldn't talk to her mom much. She had to contain. Kids are boisterous. I got five kids, man. I take a break. I open my office door. They are right there. They leap on me screaming and yelling and waving sticks. And if I screamed at them and said, I don't have time for this. You are horrible kids. 
get away from me. You're stupid. Shut up. Stop doing this. Like many people here when they're little kids, then they learn that communication and play and fun is dangerous. That's why I don't do that. I, I pick them up. I swing them around. I play with them. I say, you are loud. And then we laugh and they say, yeah, and we play and we have a great time. And I also try to cultivate them into better communication skills than what they've got right now. I foster communication rather than shutting down their communication. Most people do not get that. And that's why communication is such a problem. Your kids are definitely, they're lucky to have you, you know, because it's, it's not a common, it's not a common way necessarily of like being taught. So, so that's really cool. The, the other um, interesting thing or, or question I get is, is question I have is like, how do you get your partner to sort of open up to you if you are like, you know, they're, they're not really that, that sort of communicative. Like you mentioned it, I think, in, in one of the trust things whereby you almost might have to lead through your own action, you know, by actually doing it yourself and then maybe encourage, encouraging them to do the same. Is that like one mechanism or are there better ones? Are you asking me how to get your wife to open up more? No, not really, because I think we, we even, <laughs> we actually even had the chat yesterday. I was like, I was like, I'm really much more open, you know, especially lately <laughs> about, about certain things um, than, than I feel you are. So it's not, it's not really that. Cause like, I don't have a problem at all, you know, to, to be honest with my wife. It never has been a problem for, for but, but I do, I do have like guys in my group coaching and, you know, these are things we talk about and, uh, you know, I'd love to hear from an expert yeah. what your thoughts are. Two things happen there. One, the person themselves has to learn how to share. And there's something that I teach in my coaching practice called solution focused sharing, which is you, you tell a person why you're, you're you know, you, you tell them, Hey, can I get five minutes from you? Then you say, I'm going to share a thing with you. I'm sharing it with you because you, you have been through it before, or I, sh I really respect you. You are wisdom or you're wise and insightful. Uh, it's a field you've been in before. It's something you've accomplished, whatever the reason is. And then you share what you want from them before you've even shared. Uh, I want your feedback. I want a solution. I want your take on what I'm going to do. Uh, I just want your insight on the situation itself. Something like that, right? You, you, you do the ask and then you share what you're going to share. And you say, and you, and you share, you share the components, you disclose, but you do it with that, that in mind. And then as you do that, then you ask them again, follow up for the feedback you're looking for. You know, what, what's your insight? What are your thoughts? What would you do? Et cetera. What you've done here, instead of the bleh dumping is you don't dump a horrible amount of disconnected feelings on somebody. Then they frantically stress out as they try to figure out what the hell you want then they say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that and pat you on the back. And then you feel bad because you got nothing out of it. They feel bad because they know that they missed something. And then you both separate. And you never speak again or make eye contact and it ruins the friendship. So they need to solution focused share on purpose so that they can really share with you. Otherwise, they imagine themselves doing the first and they think it's horrible. So then they won't share at all. So they need to understand how and when and where to share like that. And they need to understand that you want this from them, which is the second component. You need to go to them and be able to convey to them, hey, it means a lot to me when you share with me. It really tells me that you trust me. It really tells me that you value anything about me outside of, you know, just how, how pretty I am. It's nice that you're, you're sharing with me and giving me those thoughts. I also really benefit from, and I value the chance to give you any kind of feedback or wisdom at all that might be helpful. So the more that you share with me, the more I feel like I know you and the more respected and, and cared for that I feel. So if you're open to sharing, I'd really appreciate that. That right there provides them that context. It opens the door and it makes them feel like you won't use it against them, but you're also not going to resent them for that sharing. So if they learn solution-focused sharing, and if they learn that you want it from them, then they can begin to explore it. And that really is the crucial step right there, one and two. I really like that. It reminds me a lot of what Jordan Peterson says uh, in like relationships and stuff. He's like, you know, you're, you're not opponents. You actually want to be teammates. And, and effectively what you're doing there is like you are, you're trying to convey like maybe a bit of a difficult message or, or start a tough conversation, but you inviting them into the conversation because you're like, I, I would like, you know, I'd like your advice or whatever it is on here. So they immediately, they go from like the back foot, you know, to the front foot because they're not, now they're not like, they're not feeling challenged. They're like, oh, they actually want my, my help here. Okay. And then you, yeah. And then you kind of like. I mean, you're, you're off on the, on the right track there from the start, if you can do that, eh? That's it. Well, what you've done is you've gone to them and said, I respect you. 
I really think you're wonderful and I value your time and I value you as a person. So can I share a vulnerable thing with you so that we can find a solution together? Nobody hates to hear that. Everybody loves that. So if they know that they can share with you in that way and inspire good feelings in you while they are sharing and, and being understood, most people will do it. It's just that in childhood, they were you know, verbally slapped for trying to do exactly this thing. All of us try to do that when we're kids. They got slapped for it emotionally or physically. Now you're wondering, now they're going to wonder if you will do it or if you like that. So teach them that you like it. Help them have the experience. Where did your like fascination and interest start with the humans and psychology? I grew up in the Center Valley in California, where one of the ground zeros for, for major massive family disruption and brokenness. Um, I was the kid at 12 years old that was counseling the other kids not to, not to remove themselves from life, uh, so to speak. I was the kid trying to keep the other kids alive, um, talk to them about their concerns, their feelings, and just keep anybody from doing anything foolish at 12 years old. Uh, it, it gradually dawned on me by the time I was about 18, 19, maybe 20, that I could actually get some training in doing this, help people, and, and maybe keep more people alive. So I went to school fully through six years of school, got my master's degree in psychology. And then another three years after that, got my apprenticeship under multiple different clinicians, built my license at that point, got my full licensure nine-year process to become a marriage and family therapist. And along the way, I was very frustrated with the medical model that we use for mental health, the disease model. You have a disease. Your brain simply, the chemicals are bad and we need to give you drugs. And then you will go to therapy and talk about how bad your brain chemicals make you feel. And you probably won't get better, but you can go to therapy forever on a subscription model and keep taking an elevating number of drugs to try to deal with all the side effects that come along with them. It sounded pretty horrible to me. And I kept asking my teachers and my supervisors, where do these mental health problems come from? And none of them could really answer me. And that frustrated me. So I started really diving into the research nobody else was looking at, diving into the topics nobody else would talk about. And attachment theory really stood out to me. It was something in graduate school they briefly touched on, told us, don't worry about this crap. This is for babies. It's not really for mental health practitioners. So I dove in there and really wanted to understand more. And then it was, it was like a light bulb went off in my brain. I went fully exploded on in, in, in brilliance. And I said, this is, this is it. This is everything I've been looking for. So attachment theory has become my absolute obsession in life and, and teaching it to everybody who will listen to it. Are there things that like are out there like attachment theory that, that, that are, that are like worth sort of diving into or that you have, have an interest in as well? Like you think that, oh, wow, they didn't teach us this. They, they, they should have taught us it. Is there anything else there that's like fascinating? For me, it was um, another one that comes very, very close is just the phenomenal feeling of, of fatherhood. That's something that I, I hadn't, I always wanted kids. Even when I was 15, 16, I, I just wanted kids. I always have, but the feeling of holding your child in, in your arms for the first time, the amount of purpose it gives you, the drive the, that you could crawl over a field of broken glass and laugh the whole way if it meant that you were taking care of your child, the, the things you can accomplish, the, the mission and the, just the purpose it gives you. There's so many young men today who think, ah, I don't really want to be a dad. It's not really a big deal. It's just a lot of burden. It's just a lot of problems. Who needs all that? And I, I think we have robbed young men of the understanding that, yes, masculinity finds its root in personal sovereignty and freedom, strength, liberation. It, it finds its personal it, its root in personal sovereignty. But masculinity really finds its root it really finds its maturity and responsibility. And I think fatherhood, well, it may not be the, it may not be the road for every man. I, I think that every man should look deeply at fatherhood, take a fresh set of eyes looking at it. Don't, don't believe what people have told you through life. Really take a look at fatherhood and the ability to create legacy and purpose and value and meaning in not only your life, but in a family to come. I absolutely love that you, that you say that. Uh, when I first met my wife, I was kind of the guy that was like, I don't, I don't really want, you know, like I don't, I don't really want kids. <laughs> I don't know. I was just, I was obviously in this kind of just sort of selfish phase, I guess, of my life where I was like, oh, you know, I love what I do. I, I like to travel and I like my lifestyle and whatnot. And, but from day one, she was like, I want babies, you know, like, and uh, so I kind of like, that was sort of like put out there straight away. And then, you know, I'm so grateful that like I, I met her because 
you know, like eventually we're, I was like, I can't wait to, to have kids. And, you know, we've got a, a beautiful daughter now and I just agree with absolutely everything that you're saying. It like, there's this like sense of true divine purpose that kind of like lights up inside of you when you, when you become a father. And it's, it's like one of the greatest growth kind of, um, mechanisms that's a, that's a bad word but like ways to grow you know personally uh, i think is is having a child like they they literally shine the lights on you on in terms of okay cool i've got this issue that i need to sort out myself um if you're a conscious enough person i guess and um also just like they just give you this new zest and and outlook on life and it's such a great reminder you know to to have fun and to not take yourself so seriously and to just enjoy the moment. It's, it really is a, a magical experience. I'm really glad that you said that. Man, I hope every guy listening to this is, is going to take a second look, right? Don't run out and just impregnate someone, but, but take a second look at, at what fatherhood really can offer to you as far as that richness, that fulfillment. I have so many of my male coaching clients come to me in their 60s and 70s, and that's one of the big things they really tell me is, Adam, you know, I, I wish I had had kids. Or now that I don't have kids, what am I going to do? And yes, yes, there is purpose. There's meaning in life, even outside of children. There's meaning there. Deep fulfillment there can be. But but kids is one of the simplest, most biologically driven pathways to that purpose that, that men need to not let themselves be robbed of. Make a decision for yourself while there still is appropriate time. An idea that I've kind of been playing with myself uh, since becoming a father is that to be a truly good leader, and, and I'm talking maybe more, say, like in the, say the office environment, okay, as opposed to maybe the leader of a sports team, but to be a truly good leader, you, you need to be a father or, or a parent because it provides you with this kind of like different view of the world and, and more of a roundness as, as, a, as a person. You can understand other people better too. I don't know if you've ever kind of like thought about that at all yourself or you have any thoughts on it now? I will say that the skill sets often overlap. Leadership is leadership uh, and leadership for somebody that you genuinely love and care about uh, creates much more of a servant leadership mentality, which you can really carry into the office, carry into your corporation, your business, whatever it is. A, a leadership, servant leadership mentality can be enormously helpful and children are a natural pathway toward learning servant leadership. In my group coaching you feature a lot. Like I'm always like, check this thread out, uh, listen to this podcast. So like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan and I, I think what you're saying is, is, is hugely beneficial. And, and it's also, it's quite like, you know, your, your breadth is getting kind of wider and wider in terms of, of, I guess what you, what you offer. And one of the things that we were talking about this week was the, a guy struggles with uh, perfectionism. Like he, he wants to do things, but he's just like such a perfectionist that he, he will not do it. You know what I mean? And I often also, I kind of relate perfectionism a little bit to uh, like fear sometimes, because you, you know, you, you're fearful of, of how, what you want to do is going to be received. Um, so you almost hide under the sort of umbrella that, you know, this has to be perfect. You know, you, you've actually developed a, a system around, you know, how people sort of overcome fear and rejection. What do you think those do you think those two things are linked? And then also how do people overcome fear and rejection? You know, fear of rejection is really what they felt as children. They were rejected many times by their parents in some capacity or another, whether the parents meant to or not. So rejection became so immensely fearful and painful for them in childhood that they can they can barely tolerate it in adulthood. Um, reminds me of that famous meme, right? The guy's like, well, you should ask her out. The worst thing she can say is no. And the girl says you instead, right? Like that's, that's what, that's what guys are terrified of. Fear of rejection is massive for most people, especially people with attachment issues, because being rejected itself sounds like, and feels like such a judgment upon your worth as a person, but your safety as well. And, and just your, 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 your worthiness of love at the same time. If somebody rejects you, it feels like that person is stamping you with a final judgment. And so people crave that approval and they run away from being stamped and judged in, in, in a bad way. I, 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 what I tell people is this. 
if you live your life trying to get the approval of everybody around you, then you will never really approve of yourself and nobody meaningful will ever approve of you. The only way to really build that, that satisfaction, that contentment is to decide what principles you will live by and die by the principles, the honor code, the mission, all of that tied in. Who are you? How do you make your decisions? Is it based on collapsing into your feelings and your fear, or is it by living to your honor code, even when it costs you something, even when it's frightening, living to it? If you do that, you will start respecting yourself. Other people of worth will also respect you. That's that four levels of trust we talked about. If you want to overcome fear, you must be afraid of something more than discomfort. You must be afraid of something more than the judgment of others. You must be more afraid of that. You must be afraid of, you must be afraid of being and living and dying as a person without principles and who violates the principles you hold. A person without purpose, a person without meaning. You should be more afraid of that than you're afraid of other people. So how do they overcome it though? Like exactly, what, do you, what sort of steps do you suggest? Say some guy comes into my, in my uh, coaching practice. Session one, we do a full assessment on his life. Session two, I say, okay, you have, you are, you do not like yourself or respect yourself because you are collapsing into your fear and other people can't respect you because you're a man who gives into his fear. Let's change that today. So I sit down and I say, let's draft out the three principles in your life that you actually hold and that you are ashamed that you don't hold play, play that you don't hold to where are you ashamed in your life and what principles were violated when you did that? Where would you be most ashamed if somebody came up and said, hmm, you're not really a man of blank, are you? You're not a man of honesty or integrity or loyalty or compassion or courage. You, you're not those things, are you? Right? Um, where are you? Where have other people hurt you? Other people who have hurt you, what was it that they violated in that moment that would have held them back from doing those bad things? That also can be a place where your principles are drawn from but they're pain-based. Typically you understand what it's like not to live with these principles. You pick two or three that resonate with you. Loyalty, honesty, courage, integrity, creativity, uh, you know, justice and anything that, that might match what you're feeling. Um, once you have those three, I say, write them on your bathroom mirror. Number one, number two, set a reminder every morning, about 45 minutes after you wake up that says, I am a man of blank, blank, and blank. The research on this is really interesting. And, and Gareth, you probably know some of this research because because you're a motivated dude. Uh, if you say, I like these things, or I will do these things, or you just list the three things, you have about a 30% chance of following through. If you make it an identity, I am a man of these components, you have about an 80% chance of following. through. And then every night, so you read that every morning, and every night you set a reminder about 45 minutes before bed. Did I uphold my honor today? Or did I uphold my principles today? Did I live to my principles today? How, whatever phrasing resonates with you. You pause and reflect for a minute or two. This is not guilt or grief or beating yourself up. It's, did I fall short? If I did, what led to that? What was the chain of events? How can I fix that next time? What do I need to do differently tomorrow? Do I need to make atonement for what I did wrong? How am I going to make sure I step forward better tomorrow? If you did, man, high five, big pat on the back. You did it. You conquered one day. Excellent. You build a chain of days through, through diligent work and patching holes. As you fail, you build a chain of days where you succeed. Now you have a massive chain of days proving that you are a man of your principles. And now you've built self-respect and now other people start to see it and they respond to you differently because you're making decisions based on your principles instead of collapsing into fear. And people notice that. That's how you really get past that fear. Even that perfectionism, even past approval seeking people pleasing this is how you bust through that is it i guess like people that that are fearful are also lacking confidence maybe and, and what you said there you know like by actually doing these things people other people start noticing and you know when other people start noticing changes in you like you, you know you like you start feeling a bit more confidence and stuff yourself so i'm just wondering is that confidence like lack of confidence related to people that have issues with fear. Yeah. Lack of confidence um, generally comes from two places. One, you yourself know that you are not a person of principles, so you're afraid of being exposed. Or lack of confidence comes from number two, other people have not accepted you and you therefore feel unacceptable. 
right? A baby, I hate this concept of self-love. It's garbage. A baby is not born, in, born loving themselves, right? A baby has no idea what they deserve. A baby doesn't know who's going to love them and who won't. They learn through experience if they are lovable or if other people are capable of love is what they learn. Is love going to exist in my world? That's the question for babies. It's not, hmm, I love myself. Oh no, it was taken from, no, that's, that's not how that game works. So the baby, what did the baby learn? That baby is you. What did you learn? Now what's going to help you learn something else instead? Have those changed experiences. And you do that by making the experiences yourself, by crafting them. By identifying through the four levels of trust, who you can trust, and then going to them, having the conversations, telling them you want to achieve better satisfaction in life, telling them you want to be a better person, asking for their assistance, asking to be accountable, making them an accountability buddy, just having experiences where you are accepted by opening up and sharing with them. As you do that, you change your experiences, which change your beliefs about the world, which change your behaviors and habits in response to your beliefs, which then changes your brain, your neurochemistry. And then you start suppressing the fear response. You start suppressing the cortisol release. You start systematic desensitization of those fear spirals. And you start shutting down all that brain chemistry that's leading to all that fear. That's how you break out of the fear prison. What I like about all the things that you, you're saying, I guess the, the resolutions, is that actually they're not like rocket science. You know, they're actually quite simple. And, and I, this is what I always try and tell like the guys in my group and stuff. I'm like, I'm not going to teach you anything crazy at all. Trust me. I'm going to teach you the most simple, basic things that everyone should really be doing, but they don't because they, they think to change, they need these like complex systems and this and that. And it's like, no, no, you actually just need to do small things consistently. You know, you talked about like writing about who I am as a man, like, you know, I guess people, other people have things like affirmations and stuff. And all those things really are just kind of like reminders about who you are, what you want to do. And you know, and it, it only takes like five minutes in the morning to, to say those things. Or you, like you said, you write it on the mirror. I think David Goggins has the accountability mirror where you put on post-it notes and you remind yourself what it is that you got to do. These things are not like, they're, they're not big things, you know, but you just have to put in that little bit of effort daily to change yourself. And I think that's a, that's a good thing for people to realize. It's absolutely true. If you can just make the little adjustments and the little conversations that you'd be shocked at how they start to snowball upward and really build and pick up momentum and how your brain chemistry changes, your experiences change, your beliefs change, your habits change, your brain chemistry shifts, everything shifts just a little bit. And that makes it easier to shift the next experience and the next experience and the next experience until you're, you're snowballing out of control into a wonderful life. That's exactly how it builds. Another one of the guys in my group He's having a bit of a rough time at the moment, right? Uh, with his in in, in his uh, marriage, and his wife is, I think she's been quite avoidant. And I was watching one of your videos yesterday on YouTube, and you it's about how to love an avoidant person. It, it's it, it's mostly I think focused at men, but you like <laughs> this works for men and women. Uh, so like, why do people become avoidant, and how do you actually? deal with them? Like, how do you almost get them on your side again? Yeah. So avoidant attachment style comes about from in childhood, they receive almost no oxytocin bonding at all. So no warmth, no intimacy, or very little. And if they do receive any, it's associated with pain and people turning on them, people being inconsistent later on, or smothering them with their emotions. So then they learn that other people are going to be arbitrary. Other people are going to fight and scream and yell. And then when people get stressed out, it makes them withdraw firmly and fiercely because they try to get away from other people who are now a problem, the liability. When other people become emotional, they are a liability. I need to get away and solve problems alone. It's lone wolf syndrome. So the, the idea is that they don't distrust you. They don't trust anybody. They distrust everybody. You're just the, the least untrustworthy person in their world, which is why they're currently with you. That's generally how that goes. So people take them personally when they don't share People take it personally when they withdraw. People take it personally when they won't open up about problems and reciprocate with sharing the way that you're doing. People take it personally and it's not. It's just that they've never, ever really had the experience of openness, of emotional intimacy, of healthy bonding, of real fulfillment in those relationships. They've never experienced that. So then you're trying to get them to do it and beg and plead with them and, and then get frustrated with them. And all they see is that you're becoming more out of control, more emotional, more unreasonable, 
and they say, oh, look, you're being like everybody else. So they start to back away because they're concerned. It doesn't mean they don't care about you or that they don't love you. It's just that they don't understand what you're trying to do with them at all. And they don't understand what you're trying to offer to them either. So with avoidant people, I, I just released a video course called How to Love an Avoidant Man. And the people who are taking that, the biggest change that they see is learning to speak the avoidant person's language. It's one of risk assessment. So you almost have to speak like an insurance claims adjuster and, and say, okay, here is the risk that I'm experiencing in our relationship. Here's the frustration point. Uh, here is the need that I have as a result of it. Here is why that need is important to me. Here is how often I need that need taken care of. Back to that what, why, and how often. But then here's the benefit to you and the benefit to our overall relationship if this is taken care of. So knowing all of this, can we now take care of this? If in return, we can, if we can, in return, what compensation do you require so that we can take care of this in a fair way and you are cared for as well? If you can speak this way to a most avoidant people, if they're what I call ethically avoidant and they're not manipulative, then they will work with you because this is what they understand. If you speak to them in emotional language, I need to feel loved. They have no idea what that sounds like. They have no idea what it feels like to feel loved. You may as well say, I need you to transform into a unicorn and fly me around the moon because they have no idea how to do that either. Both are equally confusing. They can't really do either one. So you need to make it measurable, clear, show them the benefits, show them the value, show them you're not being arbitrary. And in fact, show them that you are working with them. And what that does is release vasopressin. Vasopressin is a hormone release when you solve challenges together and accomplish things together and you release, uh, you relieve cortisol and stress together and make things more peaceful. That's vasopressin. So you vasopressin bond with them. That's a backdoor bonding to help them understand you are on their side. And over time, they start to transform and usually start to work with you in a better way. So there is like the the possibility of them actually changing, I guess, how they behave and becoming more open to actually receiving love in a, I don't know, more normal way, maybe. I don't know if that's the right way to say it. Yes. It's not just a possibility. It is the goal. That is the goal for a relationship to be able to thrive is for an avoidant person to become more secure with you and build a secure relationship where they are fulfilled, where they are at peace and they are content. That is the goal is to build that with them. Otherwise it won't thrive. And what are the differences between coaching men and coaching women? I mean, I don't know if that's too much of a wide question. Uh, so it depends on the people that come to you. Um, me, as far as me, the people that come to me tend to be very practically minded. They, they've gone through five therapists. None of that has really helped. They spent, you know, $10,000 over the course of 20 years in therapy. And they say, you know, Adam, I, I, I can't do therapy again. I, please not the feelings. Just tell me what to do. And they tend to want to come to somebody who is going to be almost like a fixer or a contractor. You know, here's where the holes are. I don't like it. Patch those holes here, renovate this room and fix this for me. And then just do this and this and this. Cool. That's a coach's job, as you know. Uh, but the, the, the men that come to me tend to be very massively high performing, right? Some of them have, you know, $10 million in the bank. Some of them have $100 million companies that they've, they've built. Some of them have a $9 million prenup and three houses, and they're about to lose their third, their third divorce kind of thing. Um, but they're, they're very high performers who are very lonely and very unfulfilled, and they sense there's something missing, but they don't know what it is, and they want answers. They want answers, and once they have those answers, they want a couple of experiences, and they tell me to tell them what to do, and then they take off running like a shot. And they want, they, they want to do it themselves and learn because they want to go conquer this new frontier that they've learned about emotional connection. And, and they, they come back every so often and check in when they, when they hit a wall, they come back in, we jump over that wall, they, they take off running. Uh, when I coach women, what I found is that they, they're, not, they're not less determined, but they love more processing. They want to process typically a bit more. They want to talk about it, get my thoughts on it. They want to sort of unpack what they've experienced. And then they want to plan the next steps together. And they usually come to me for planning. They don't come to me when they've hit a wall and they've beat their head against the wall for three months and they're miserable and they finally come in. They, they come to me when they say, okay, I'm going to take a next step and I want to plan it with you first. Cool. That's fantastic. So with women, I do a lot of planning. With men, I do a lot of overcoming. Those are typically the two differences I see. When you are working with like high performers, is there like any traits within them that you think cause them to have issues in relationships? Oh yeah. That's that avoidant attachment style. 
the, the lone wolf syndrome. It's they're on the dopamine course, the cortisol pathway. So they have massive cortisol, which drives them to be hyper vigilant and they keep drama out of their life. So they climb the mountain and they get to the top and they, they manage with dopamine as needed. They have very few connections holding them back, but then they hit the top of the mountain and there's nothing there. There's nothing to keep climbing. It's just a windswept mountaintop. Suddenly they can't relate to their board of their, their board, their, their, you know, their executive board suddenly can't relate to the other C-suite executives. Suddenly they can't relate to their team. Suddenly no one's loyal to them. They're only loyal to a paycheck because they've never built a, a loyal personal relationship. Suddenly their kids won't really speak to them. Suddenly their wife is thinking about divorcing them. If they even have a wife, sometimes they're, they're lonely and they don't even have a partner. They've been through a string of girlfriends. The top is a very lonely place. And if you only have cortisol and dopamine, you are just going to fall back down the mountain and be wretchedly miserable as you dismantle what you put forth. I've seen it so many times. Instead, you need to make the transition into a second state that says, I will now build. Instead of climbing, I will build upon this mountaintop. And you build relationships with your board members, with the other executives, with the people you're going to mentor with your family, if you have them, with a new family, if you need to build that. You foster the fulfilling relationships that build your tower upon that mountaintop so that you really mark your legacy and you really are fulfilled and thriving and you're not lonely anymore. That, that's the steps that I see, really. And you must make that transition from lone wolf cortisol dopamine pathway into the oxytocin, serotonin, vasopressin pathways of bonding. It's so interesting how many people that are like high performers and that earn like billions are actually lonely. I had a very interesting guy on my podcast uh, not too long ago, a guy called Adam Rossi that clearly operates in different sort of levels to us, you know, and, and has those sort of friends. And he, that's exactly what his, he's like. He's like, Gareth, I know like, you know, billionaires that are totally lonely, you know, and in their pursuit of, trying to be successful and, you know, working hard and building, you know, these mega companies, they, they've kind of like just forgotten everything and everyone in that pursuit. And now they've got all the money in the world, but they've got nobody in the world. That's, that's, that's the majority of my clientele right there is people who have built and built shelter for other people and built companies. And they're standing at the top of the mountaintop saying, where the hell do I go from here? That's the majority of people that come into me. And, and what's astounding is that most of them have the people in their life that they already need. It's just that they, they have no idea how to reach out to them. It's like, it's like starving to death while, while looking through a glass wall at a, a delicious feast on the other side of that wall that you have no idea how to get through that wall and get to that food. That's, that's what they're living. And if that's what anybody out there right now is, is living and experiencing, it's fixable, you guys. It's fixable. Do you think like ego gets in the way of them reaching out to those people that they really need to, or is it just a total lack of understanding about this, you know, like uh, their attachment style? I hear you. Ego is a symptom of the deeper problem. The deeper problem is I am the only one who cares how I feel and nobody is ever going to even care. And then it becomes, I will care and protect myself. And the only thing propping you up is your sense of self-respect. And then that feels like you can never ask anybody for anything because they're going to spit in your face or laugh at you and they're not even going to help you. So then ego becomes a protective measure of I will never be laughed at and mocked like that. So I'm never going to ask for the things that I will never receive. I think that the vast majority of these men, if they really believed somebody would care and that there could be a fair exchange of value where they weren't going to be a charity case either, where they could really give and receive in turn and have real satisfaction most of these men would give both of their arms to have that and that's that's what they're looking for something also interesting that you spoke about when you were speaking to chris was about therapy itself and almost like how therapy for couples is not necessarily designed in often the guy's favor uh, and you know for for various different reasons uh, half of it is because the the guy is, or the woman is already prepared and the guy kind of has no idea. And then you also mentioned that almost like the way, uh, I guess, psychologists uh, are, are maybe, or, you know, psychotherapists are trained is like to, to generally side with the woman. That's kind of like how, what I picked up a little bit in, in that conversation. I don't know how, if, if that's, um, if I picked up the right thing, but uh, it's, it's interesting that you say like therapy 
also doesn't necessarily work. I think it was like a high percentage, like 90% of the time or something crazy like that. Keep in mind that therapists are trained to engage with people's emotions and to have conversations with people about those feelings and then find solutions, hopefully for them. And when a couple walks into couples therapy, the woman is usually going to be overly expressive about problems. She's going to burst into tears and be overwhelmed and cry. And the man is going to sit there on the defensive, closed minded, closed, closed mouth, just staring, feeling like he's bad and then hoping he's not going to get screamed at. And then when you have a therapist who's there waiting to engage, watching a woman talk and talk and talk and cry and cry and cry, and the man just sits there like a stone statue. Unfortunately, many therapists will immediately reach the conclusion, this man doesn't care. This man is the problem. She's communicating. Look how loud and commun look how communicative she is being. This woman has tried everything. It's clearly the man's fault. And then they come down on him. And second to that is most therapists know that the woman is the reason they're there in therapy in the first place. So if you make the woman angry in the first couple sessions, she probably is going to leave and never come back and you've now lost your paycheck. So there, there is that component to some therapists as well. You, you need to be aware of that. And that's why even many women will say, you know, we've been to therapy, couples therapy, and I hated it because it was so ineffective. And the, even women, good women will be angry that the therapist sided with her over her husband. They're like, I got mad because the therapist was siding with me. I hear that all the time. I got mad because the therapist was siding with me and telling me he's bad. And I know he's not bad. He's good. We're trying to make it work. And then they told us to get a separation. We don't want to do that. And I say, okay, yeah, come on, come on in. <laughs> let's fix this. Let's, let's solve your problems. It'll probably take five sessions. Like, let's get this knocked out real fast. You never do this again. And, and but that's, I was a marriage and family therapist for years. I know there's wonderful marriage and family therapists out there. I also know that we are churning them out at an astronomical rate. I know that many of them are coming out not prepared the way they need to. I know there's personal biases. I know that those therapists often have attachment issues and personality issues and, and mental health issues. They have relationship challenges. They have bad marriages themselves. Marriage and family therapists are the ones most likely to have a divorce of all the therapists approaches out there, right? So it is very, 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 very likely that you are probably going to have a difficult time in that experience if you walk in already stressed out and your therapist might be stressed out and they're not dealing with their ad their problems adequately. So good therapists can generally create good therapy systems. Unfortunately, there's a lot of therapists and not all of them are good. So be smart. That's all I'm saying. Be smart. Take control of your own well-being. Yeah, it's fascinating how you you go to somebody for help but they actually like <laughs> divorced three times themselves. Uh, but and I think it also, you know, like sometimes in, in people's defense, we, we're often much better at giving advice than like following our own advice or receiving advice, I think. You know, and, and that's a component to it. Um, uh, the man that trained me the most, his name was Jesse. Uh, he was a divorced marriage and family therapist. And he used to say, people ask me, Jesse, you're divorced. Why are you giving us marriage advice? And he said, yeah, it's a fair question. He said, look, other people will tell you what to do. I will tell you what not to do because I've seen it go disastrously wrong. And I will be a living warning to you guys about what not to do. And I will exactly warn you about the pitfalls you're stepping into and the traps that you're creating for yourselves. And they'd say, oh, that's a fair point. So, and I, that was the only it was the only time that a, th a marriage or family therapist has ever that was divorced ever really told it really brought something to me. It was like, you know, that makes sense. Somebody who it has gone wrong and they have owned that, that makes sense. But if they're just out there wandering around angry, defensive that their marriage went bad and they haven't owned it or dealt with it yet, that's called counter. That's called uh, counter transference. When you transfer onto your patient and you start telling them how to live. Unfortunately, there's way too many therapists out there telling people how to resolve issues of the way they wish they had resolved them with their own spouse. Yeah, it's quite fascinating how there's so many people walking around with undealt issues, um, undealt with trauma, et cetera, et cetera, and um, yeah, are giving other people advice. So, so anyway, in, in, it makes for an interesting world, that's for sure. And I guess it makes your client list nice and long because they can then come to you after not having their issues sorted out to those sort of people. So <laughs> it works very well in your favor. But I was just wondering, Adam, what are you most excited about uh, in the future? What do you have like coming up that's, uh, that's cool? Oh, I'm glad you asked that. I have um, something I'm very excited for is I, I, I believe that you have to experience 
attachment before you can really feel it, before you can live it. It's not thinking about attachment or learning about attachment. It's, it's experiencing it. So I am building a retreat called the Attachment Immersion Retreat. It'll be later this year in October, probably at a resort in Colorado up in the mountains is what I'm thinking up in the Vale. And I'm going to have a very select, intimate group of people come up and experience attachment with me, with some other staff I'm going to bring into the experience as well to really train people out in skills and in bonding, helping them open up properly and, and really transform themselves over the space of a few days. And I cannot wait to announce this, to, to put tickets on sale for people to come. The, of, again, it's going to be very exclusive, so there won't be many tickets available because I, I want this to be a very intimate affair. I don't want a thousand people tramping around trying to talk about attachment. That's not an intimate experience, um, but maybe 20, 25 people, something like that. Very small um, I cannot wait. Oh, I cannot wait for this experience to happen. Sounds like a really cool thing to kind of facilitate. Uh, and also, I mean, sounds like a new experience for yourself as well. So probably a lot of learning in there as well. I cannot wait, man. I, uh, my earliest gig as a therapist was working with inmates. They would lock me in a room with 16 convicted murderers and walk away and tell me to get to help those guys get along and learn relationship skills. And my love working with small groups really grew out of the work I did with those men and building life skills and building better families, even among, uh, among people like that, uh, people who were, were facing some of the worst consequences for the worst decisions. I mean, and families that were, were kept apart from incarceration, um, growing now and working with executive people, uh, working with high performing families, people that you fix their family and then it ripples through their companies and it fixes a hundred or a thousand other families. It's an honor to be able to work with people that are at that level operating there, but just, oh, I've always loved working with, with small, intimate groups of people and helping them transform together because it's not one-on-one, -on -one, just me. It's them transforming each other at the same time. It's uh, you could tell it's, it's a passion of mine. Absolutely. That's uh, that's quite a nice playground to, to learn your, your trade, you know, it's just working with inmates. I can only imagine how fascinating and insightful that was for you. My, my last question for you, Adam, uh, is like, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? It means acting like a child and not, not in a way that's disruptive, maybe, but acting like a child in being unafraid to ask questions and to engage in the conversations that children will engage in. My kids ask me for stuff all the time, but they also ask me questions they want to understand. They ask me when things are tense. They ask me why they are tense. They ask me if things are happy, why they are happy. They want to understand everything. And we as adults, that's really what kills us, I think, in so many ways, is we stop asking questions, we start making assumptions, or we start operating out of fear because we feel that we're not allowed to ask those questions. Ask more questions and you'll become ridiculously human, but also ridiculously happy. Mm -hmm. I love that. So like you remain curious. I think it's such a important thing as a human is just to kind of remain curious and everything, you know, and like I said, just keep asking those questions. So really cool thing. And I just wanted to say like a massive thanks for, for coming on the, on the podcast. It's, it's been a huge honor, buddy, and, and a privilege and, you know, just like listening to your wise words and uh, your different experiences and uh, the, all the advice that you shared is just like, really like, uh, it's just amazing. So thank you for your time. I know you're a super busy man and uh, you have a hell of a lot going on. Um, but you also like, you're also such a relatable bloke and uh, like genuine and authentic, you know, and I think that's really what people crave these days. And I can imagine that's why like you, you're super successful is because you, you are that kind of relatable guy. And uh, that, that means a lot in this day and age. So even just by being yourself, you're influencing people to, to be like better people. So, so that, that's super cool. Thanks so much for your time, buddy. Thank you for that, man. <laughs> Pleasure.